The last issue that we need to address with machine instructions is path planning. So when we develop our NC code, we don't just want to randomly select paths for the tool, but there has to be some rationale for selecting that path. When you think of a path, you can think of it as a generic curve in the sense of we're moving uh, in our XYZ and we're specifying a tool location during that operation as we've seen with the G01, G02, and G03. Note that a lot of the examples that we did were two-dimensional, but in reality most of our uh, paths are going to be three-dimensional in nature and depending upon the configuration of the machine, uh, we may, may be moving in all three dimensions simultaneously. Note that every path that we define has to be approximated with either linear, or G01, or circular segments, arcs, G02 or G03. So if it doesn't match up perfectly, in other words, we have a parabolic, we talked about approximating that by some sequence of linear segments. We've also noted that there are certain times when we are cutting in terms of removing material. <clears throat> and then we also have non-cutting sections where we are trying to position the tool with respect to uh, a location on the workpiece. The objectives, of course, are to minimize our overall cycle time as well as the cost to perform the operation. So one way to do that that we've already seen is to minimize the machine travel in terms of the tool. And that would be both for cutting and non-cutting. Of course, we'd like to minimize non-cutting as a fraction of the total cycle time. And we'd also like to minimize setups. By that, we mean different orientations of the workpiece with respect to the machine. And at the same time, provide enough accessibility to get to all the, of the features. Of course, the constraint here is avoid collisions, collisions with fixtures, collisions with other features we've already created on the workpiece. So think of the tool volume based upon the shape, such as the end mill, intersecting with the material, whatever material that is, that can cause a collision. And of course, that's to be avoided because that usually ends up with broken tools or damage to the workpiece. The time elements associated with our cutting paths are, first of all, the machine setup, where we may have to orient the part in the fixture, and that is non-value added time, or where we actually have to attach a new fixture to the machine table. And of course, we're concerned when we do this about accessibility of the tool to the features that we need to create. Then we have our tool change time, which involves, first of all, unloading the collet from the spindle, and then it's removed and placed into its proper location in the carousel. And then the load time, which involves first a seek time to rotate the carousel to the proper position, remove the tool, and then insert it into the collet. So this all takes some time to perform that operation. So you'd like to minimize the number of tool changes because that just adds additional time to your overall cycle time. And then finally, as we've said, the path travel time for the tool is based upon the feed rate and our positioning velocity to that location, uh, especially with our G00s. So the approach here is to consider the constraints that you have to live with. So if you have a certain machine capability uh, in terms of, for instance, the axes that you can control, your X, Y, and Z, uh, then you're going to have to limit your paths to that capability. We've already seen the constraints of tooling, how that affects the depth of cut, the uh, speed at which we can move through the material, and it's not completely independent of the material that we are trying to machine. So th these are very real constraints that will affect our feed rates, which in turn affects our travel time, which in turn affects the cycle time. In creating our paths, the very first step that we did was to determine the set of path coordinates that we need to move along. So no matter what the curve is, whether it's a straight line or a parabolic or a circular uh, path, we need to determine those path coordinates. 
And then based upon the path coordinates, we need to find this best sequence. Now, what do we mean by best? Well, best in terms of our overall cycle time, which as we've seen is reduced to a number of elements. Certainly the travel time would be an important component of that. So let's look at a simple drilling operation. Here we're going to center the tool over the whole position that we want to create. So that would involve a, involve a move to that location. <clears throat> then we're going to uh, move into the material to a specified depth, uh, if it's a through hole or a blind hole. And then we're going to have to retract the tool and then move to the next hole. So that sounds like a very simple operation. And how would we go about thinking about that in terms of path planning? Well, what appeared to be a simple operation, when we look in the context of a printed circuit board, where we have to create a number of through holes, and these can be in the hundreds, then that notion of the best path becomes more important. So how do we go about determining where our move should be? So if we're doing G00, then a G01, and coming back up, G00, <clears throat> how do we determine which holes we should visit and in what sequence? And if we have hundreds of them, uh, you can spend a lot of time uh, trying to come up with that best path. Well, if you think back to uh, IE312, you probably came across this traveling salesman problem. And in this problem, what we're trying to do is visit certain locations without retracing our steps and to find the best path given that we don't want to do any retracing. If you look at this kind of a problem, it's really a combinatorial problem because we have various permutations that we can uh, think of in visiting these three points. In order to address this, there have been a number of uh, approaches or methods that have been employed to come up with this best path. And this usually involves some type of computation, which becomes important when you have many points. If you only have a few points, then you can determine that uh, without a lot of difficulty. Well, how do these uh, methods work? The typical approach uh, for these methods are, first of all, have some initial sequence of moves. And by that we mean some combination of the points that is feasible, and again, no backtracking. Then what we do is determine the total travel time based upon what we already know about the feed rates and the points themselves. We compare the value that we get here for the total travel time to the minimum. So we're wondering, is this total travel time less than the minimum? So we have to keep track of the minimum. If so, then we're going to replace it, and it will become the new current minimum. So it's kind of a, a search approach. And then what we'll do is we'll perturb or make a slight change in our sequence Again, the sequence of points. And then we'll iterate until some stopping condition is met. And typically, the stopping condition means that we're not seeing much of a change in this total travel time. So at that point, we would say we found <clears throat> the best sequence of points. So here's an example. What if I start at the home position here with my end mill? And I need to uh, follow a path that includes points 1, 2, and 3. The question is, is there a best or optimal path associated with this sequence of points? And again, here we'll assume that we start at home, visit uh, our three points, and then return home. <clears throat> the sequence, of course, will affect our total travel time. So you should be able to determine that optimal path. In addition to having a best path, we also have to think about the volume of material that we are removing. And here we're considering our depth of cut. 
and the geometric volume that has to be removed. So when you think of the features, creating the features, you should think about them from kind of the complement point of view, and that is what volume of material needs to be removed. So if it's a, a uh, rectangular slot, then we're going to have to remove a rectangular prism. Based upon the tooling, our uh, parameters that we're using, feed and spindle speed, and the material, we need to determine the depth of cut. Now remember, a rule of thumb was one-third of the diameter. Again, that's a rule of thumb. Uh, it may be modified depending upon the matching of the tooling and the material. And then what we'll do is use a cutting plane to cut a 2D profile, whether it's in the XY plane, YZ plane, or XZ plane. And in that plane, we will follow some type of path sequence, again, based upon our best path. And then we'll move down in whatever uh, axis, for example, in the Z axis, and again, perform a similar path assuming that the cross-section of the feature is not changing. And we'll repeat this until we've removed the entire volume that needs to be removed. So when you think about the uh, profile that you're trying to create, we can think about it at different depths of cut. And don't forget to specify the path overlap, because if you are removing material, say in this type of path, we want to make sure that we don't leave a ridge in the middle here. So we'll have to have some degree of overlap. Otherwise, you'll get this uh, ridge if you look at it from the side, where essentially the material is being pushed in the second pass uh, as we go uh, by that particular location. Don't forget, you'd like to maximize your tool diameter because that will minimize the time it takes to remove that material. But of course, there are limitations to that, uh, both in terms of tooling as well as the material and the path geometry. But in uh, most cases, what you'll try to find is a good match between the tool diameter and the features that you're trying to create. So here's a simple example. Here we have a continuous cross section if we look at it from the side. And the first question is, what is the machine volume that we're going to remove? So if I look at this, what I've got is this trapezoidal cross-section. So I've got a trapezoidal slot, and I need to remove this volume of material. So how should I approach this? Well, again, you have to think about the machine configuration. If we're strictly dealing with a three-axis uh, vertical mill, then I think about my setup and how do I orient my workpiece with respect to the tooling uh, such that I minimize my setup because again that's going to contribute to my uh, cycle time. Well think about the material that you're removing if I have an end mill and let's say it's oriented with respect to the workpiece in this fashion and so this is rotating if I think of my machinable volume and what the cutting surfaces have access to, clearly I can take care of the center section, which would be uh, more the rectangular slot, and I can use my cutting planes for my depths of cut, whatever it is based upon the material and the tooling, and just move down the uh, slot and remove that central area or volume. But what I'm left with are the sides, right? So then I've got this from uh, the side view here. I've got these triangular cross sections that still need to be removed. So how do I approach that? Well, if I try to orient the workpiece, I'm going to have to rotate it first in this direction so that my tool will be uh, arrange normal so that my tool will be normal to this surface. And then I'm going to have to rotate it in a third setup in this direction so that my tool will be located or oriented normal to that surface and remove that volume again 
with the same notion of cutting planes and uh, continuing our cut until we reach our final surface that we're trying to generate. So that would involve three setups which would add significant uh, time to our overall cycle time. Now we might be tempted to uh, use just one setup and in that setup make a very uh, small depths of cut and so that we would get an approximation of this trapezoid but of course it would have this stair step effect if we were to do something like that. Now when would that be acceptable? Well you have to go back to your tolerances. So if I had a profile tolerance on this trapezoidal slot that would determine this step size. The trade-off here is that instead of three setups, we go to one setup. But because we're going to have many depths of cut in order to achieve that profile tolerance, that means my uh, travel time is going to increase significantly. And so that might be our concern. And there are a variety of ways you might think of uh, modifying that, uh, perhaps doing an initial uh, cut of the central region and then doing our uh, small steps on the sides. Another consideration might be to add an axis to our uh, fixture and essentially mount this so that we can rotate the fixture itself uh, to orient with respect to this surface and to orient with respect to that surface. If we do that then essentially we've also reduced it to one setup and uh, we have not increased the travel time significantly so that might be the best route but of course the trade-off here is you're going to spend more money on that rotational table to rotate the fixture. So it's all about trade-offs and what gets you the minimum cost per part because ultimately that's where the pressure will be on trying to reduce your cost while of course being constrained to producing a part that meets and satisfies all design specifications. So key concepts here are again you should be concerned about your setup time how many setups do you perform you need to minimize that total setup time because it is non-value adding. Our travel time is going to have an effect and that will depend upon your path planning and how you set up your best path. We'd also like to minimize our tool change time which suggests minimize the number of tools used for all of our operations.